Uh, morning, guys. As Pete says, my name is Tim Stevenson. This is um, Dave Jackson. Um, we're really excited to be sharing some of the information with you guys today. It's the first time we've really pitched or uh, put some of this stuff out to a group like yourselves. Um, it's been a, a bit of a journey to how we got to the point of exploring how using calisthenics and progressive bodyweight training can actually start to potentially improve shoulder robustness, shoulder performance function, and also bring play into an athlete's training environment, giving them some enjoyment and some tasks, um, and the complementary nature between those, may those I things. May have your attention, please. May I have your attention, please? The test is now complete. Thank you for your cooperation. It's a relief. Um, so yeah, just to give you a bit of background and some context before we get stuck into it, the, the general plan for the session is I'm going to go through 15, 20 minutes of just some, some rationale and some evidence base behind the content we're going we're gonna to share with you guys. And then Jacko is going to lead us through a practical session and get you guys trying a few things. The big thing for us is that we, we give you some ideas in terms of how you can apply this with your, your athlete groups, hopefully Monday morning or whenever it fits into your, your training programs and cycles. Um, but just the sense of the practical, we're, we're quite a large group, we've tried to bring a bit of equipment with us, um, but just get involved as much as you can and, and, and feel and experience some of the stuff that we're going to talk about, hopefully it'll bring it to life. So Jack and I both are ex rugby players, Jacko played professionally for 14 years, um, I've been a strength and conditioning coach for the last 10, specialising in, uh, in Paralympic sport, predominantly within athletics and swimming. Jacko joined me um, in another business we have one athlete about five years ago when he retired from rugby uh, from a head injury. I originally started calisthenics because I had come off the back of probably 10 years of repeated dislocations of my left shoulder. It, I don't actually know how many times I dislocated it over from the age 22 to about, well, 32, something like that. Jacko himself has broken coracoid process, a chromium process, and separated AC joint. So coming into this kind of stuff, we don't have a great background at all, no gymnastics experience whatsoever. The reason I originally started to learn to handstand or get interested in calisthenics was because I tried all of the rehab in the book. I'd done the most amount of stability ball scaptions and external rotations, and my, my shoulder just didn't actually ever stay where it was supposed to. I don't know if Gil remembers, actually, but I dislocated my shoulder on my Olympic lifting workshop with the UKCA in a velodrome in Manchester some years ago, and it's a good job he had his first aid certificate up to date, because he did a great job with the primary care, so thanks for that, Gil. I don't think I've ever really thanked you at the time. <laughs> But it was, a real, it, was, it was causing me a lot of problems, so I decided if I can handstand, that's going to give me some confidence that my shoulder is stable, which obviously is a logical process of when you're unstable overhead is to try and balance your whole body weight on top of it, but I'd kind of run out of options. What happened from that point onwards was a really interesting journey of starting to gain some confidence in my shoulder. I was also interested at the time in starting to bring some other things into the training environment, learning some different stuff that I could share with athletes. Um, and teach myself to move in a new way, the skill acquisition process of learning a new complex movement. Um, I'm 38 this year, so I started about four and a half years ago, so I didn't come into it in my peak prime. Um, so I hope that gives you guys some encouragement when we go into it today. So we've, on, on that journey, I haven't had a single instability issue since I started calisthenics. I can now put myself into positions which we'll show you in a bit in terms of human flags, this kind of stuff where my shoulder feels great, I can put high forces through it. And when I think about what I did on the UKCA lifting workshop, I had an un unloaded bar, 20 kilos doing a snatch, and I couldn't keep my shoulder in that position. But we can now start to apply um, a little bit more force and do something a bit more exciting with my shoulders, which is great. So we started to look at the evidence base and started to explore a little bit. We've bounced some ideas around some great practitioners in the industry to see what their thoughts are. Um, and that's led us to this point where we're going to share what we've, what we've come up with today. It's a work in progress, guys, and we would love to, if you've got any feedback and any thoughts and experiences of your own over the weekend, or from today and, and, press, and past, we're around all weekend, so we'd love to come and chew the fat around it as well. So please come and, come and talk to us. I'm just going to set this up with a little bit of a, with some context around to, to provide some, um, some foundation for what we're going to go through with the practical. This quote Eric Cressy uses a lot in his resource, Sturdy Shoulders, and I love it because it's the simplicity of that's the job that we're trying to do around shoulder health. Keep the ball in the socket, preferably orientated in the ideal part of the socket. If we think about what we're trying to do there, that was effectively what my shoulder looked like on a regular basis, but if we think about what we're trying to do is create that optimal alignment and then we need the shoulder to be able to keep that optimal alignment through full range of motion and with good neuromuscular control. If we can do that, we're going to have a functioning shoulder which is performing pretty well for us and we can have some confidence in. The problem is we know that we're dealing with what is probably a fairly dysfunctional population when it comes to shoulder health. Research will suggest that 67 to 80% of patients that present with shoulder injury have got some form of scapid dyskinesis. The reality is, and you guys will see these athletes in your programs all the time, we have lots of people who've got poor shoulder movement, whether that's a result of past traumas, repetitive movements as a result of the sport, or um, postural dysfunction. We've got people whose shoulders don't move well, but they're not technically injured. 
When we think about what we, with this idea of keeping the ball in the socket, even a small translation or uncontrolled translation of the humeral head in the glenoid fossa could lead to an injury to some of these guys. So we think there's an opportunity to start to explore how we can give them a little bit more robustness and control in the shoulder. And we'll, we'll take that a little bit further um, as we go through the presentation. So just some headlines to, to pitch this up. 29.3, that's what research suggests is the optimal alignment of the glenoid cavity and the long head of the humeral um, head, or the long axis of the humeral head, sorry. That sounds pretty good, so let's take that as a pinch of salt, plus minus 30 degrees. In a static position, that sounds fairly achievable, but we need to remember that that needs to happen through full range of movement as well. So as we start to go into overhead positions, we've got tons of mobility, lots of range of movement for the shoulder. We need to be trying to maintain an optimal alignment with that glenoid, the humeral head sitting in the fossa of the scapula. When we start to throw in the fact that a lot of our guys are gonna have restrictions in range of movement, we've got some poor neuromuscular pattern around the shoulder, we're gonna find that it's quite difficult for that scapula to actually continue to, to, to make that, keep that tracking in, in, in a good position. People would talk about the scapula and the humeral head having a relationship like a seal with a ball on its nose. The, the scapula is responding to and anticipating movement of the humeral head. If we've got restrictions, we haven't got great neuromuscular control. We know that the brain is going to find and give us an alternative uh, movement option. So if we get up and we haven't then got scapular rotation, protraction, whatever we require to get into these positions, the brain will just go, yeah, that's right, Tim, you, you'd be fine. I'll find you a different way. I'm going to find a movement here. And then we think about we're, we're then creating potentially uncontrolled translations around that, that head. We're not keeping it in, a, in an ideal um, sitting with the fossa. So just an idea as we go through. We need to keep good range of movement. We need good contact with those two um, structures. Secondly, just to highlight the importance and that we just take a, a given nod to the structure of the glenohumeral joint, we don't have a lot of ligamentous or bony structure holding that joint together. It's very different to the hip. So 90% of joint stability is created by muscle activation. The rotator cuff does a, a huge amount of this work by creating compression on the joint and keeping that humeral head packed into the fossa on the scapula. So that starts to give us an idea that if we're going to scale strength, velocity, force measures, whatever it might be, we need to do something to allow that shoulder to actually upgrade itself in terms of creating more stability to handle bigger forces. If we don't, we're going to find that we can put more force out through the shoulder, but are we actually doing a good job of keeping the ball of the humerus or the head of the humerus located with its optimal position in the fossa? So upgrading muscle activation around the joint is going to be a good thing of creating more stability and keeping good alignment and control from the, in the shoulder. The research literature around um, rehabilitation talks about this a lot. Kinetic chain integration and the importance of the shoulder being part of an integrated system. 50%, some research papers will suggest up to 80, but in overhead throw movements or overhead positions, 50% of the force generated through the upper limb can be generated from the limbs or the lower limbs and the midsection. So if we think about them, we have this importance. If we've got a weak link in the shoulder and we're able to generate a huge amount of force through the upper body, if we're struggling to keep the head of the, sh the humerus ideally located in its position and we haven't got good neuromuscular control around that joint, we're in a position then where we can start to think that maybe we've got a weak link here and that's going to cause a problem for us. So can we find ways within training to start to integrate the shoulder more into the kinetic chain to start to scale robustness through the whole chain and system? We talk a lot around proprioception for the shoulder as well. Proprioception being perception of movement and um, joint position sense. High levels of proprioception means we can transfer forces through the system more effectively. So forces generated proximally can be transferred better through to distal components. So and elevating proprioception, but having that as part of the kinetic chain integration is really important. And then lastly, I think this is a really interesting one. A lot of us would, would jump at the chance of 24% increase in force production if we were looking for overhead or upper body movements. If the scapula is in a stable position, we can produce more force. So taking measures to give the scapula a little bit more control, a little bit more stability, that means that we can then start to potentially increase force output. And that will be in a number of different positions, sports specifics, whether we're doing Olympic lifting or whatever. So we're talking about this, um, this uh, interdependent and this relationship between mobility, stability, and strength. If we do a good job of scaling this, because I think as strength and conditioning coaches, we do a good job here. We're, we're good at scaling force, velocity. Um, we, we know strength training well. We know stability to a certain degree, but my, my expectation is, and this is experience from my own career as, as working with a number of different, well, lots of different athletes in different sports, is we probably run out of tools at this point, and we're not quite sure how we can then continue to scale stability in line with our strength development. So what we've found is that calisthenics potentially offers an opportunity for us to do more of this, stability work at higher levels, and I'm going to give you some evidence to suggest why in a minute. 
but it also encourages this. The kinetic chain integration, for us to go into a beautifully controlled handstand, calisthenics means beautiful strength. We would all agree that we want our athletes to move beautifully. So if I go into a handstand, I need full range of movement and I need that to be integrated into the kinetic chain. You almost can't do calisthenics unless you get those things working together. So we start to think about playing to the shoulder's strengths as it is designed um, and as it kind of is the environment in which is most likely to, to um, succeed and excel. So my suggestion is that we've got an opportunity to change the environment a little bit. Rather than getting our guys going through banded external rotations, single leg cable scaptions, whatever we might do for shoulder stability, we can potentially change the environment and utilize some of the benefits that we get from closed kinetic chain training. So closed kinetic chain for the upper body often make us think about upper body resistance machines, but we can get the same environment if we fix the hand on the floor or on a bar, and we've got something in between of this spectrum of closed, of pure closed kinetic chain by using a, a suspension training system or a gymnastics ring, which gives us some resistance but also some play. The research around this, particularly around shoulders, a lot of the work done by Ben Kibler, um, gives us some indication of what's going to happen in a closed kinetic chain environment. We can increase joint compression forces, increase muscular contractions, increase eccentric contractions, and decrease shear forces by having the, the hand fixed. If we do that, we get better joint congruency, we increase proprioception, increase neuromuscular control, increase dynamic joint stability. That's all from the evidence base, and I would say that we would look at all of those and go, yeah, that's good for the shoulder, like, that sounds appealing. If we do those things, we have a better opportunity to keep the ball in the socket. So ultimately, to, for, for shoulder health and performance, we're looking for full range of motion with, connect, with a neuromuscular control through that range and with it integrated into the, into the kinetic chain. This is an interesting one um, around the muscle co-contraction. The joint compression forces are great, and we know that from the research, open kinetic chain exercises and closed kinetic chain exercises can improve joint proprioception. The difference is in closed kinetic chain exercises, we get much more muscle co-contraction, and that's the, the muscles work around the joint working to stabilize dynamic stability, or to create dynamic stability. So a really interesting thing around the shoulder, having the hand fixed and what that does into the shoulder, and calisthenics uses that, a lot of these movements. We do all of our stuff pretty much in one of these environments. So just a little bit of evidence to, to wrap this up. Um, I've picked out three papers because they just highlight some key points. This one, the top paper, closed kinetic chain of body training, um, improved um, throwing velocity or throwing performance in, in softball players. What they did was a 12-week um, study, open kinetic chain group, closed kinetic chain group. The both groups' baseline test was a, was a 1RM bench press. After the, open, sorry, the closed kinetic chain group trained using a suspension system, the open kinetic chain group trained, trained continued using bench press. What they found after 12 weeks was that bench pressing performance, 1RM, went up in comparable levels. So both, both groups improved similarly in their bench press performance. But what happened in the closed kinetic chain group was that throwing velocity improved, external rotation power improved, and um, shoulder flexion peak power improved as well. The open chain kinetic group improved bench press, but decreased performance in all of those other measures. So uh, the idea being that if we're using closed kinetic chain movements, that's actually having an impact on open chain movements which are sport specific. So it's quite interesting. We think back to the slide before about what are the benefits of using those. Potentially we were just upgrading the performance, robustness and stability around the shoulder. These last two papers are a nod towards intensity. <coughs> Excuse me. Strength training and shoulder proprioception. Pre what this group did was test the different intensities on shoulder proprioception. So they took an 8RM group and a slightly lower intensity 12RM group. What they found was that 8RM group got bigger improvements in proprioception than the 12RM group, giving us a nod towards potentially we need to be thinking about how we create more intensity for the shoulder if we're going to start to get some better improvements in proprioception. I think a lot of the time when we look at stability for the shoulder, we start thinking about Type 1 muscle fibers, higher rep volumes, lower intensity. We can spend 12 reps doing single arm scaptions or whatever it might be. But actually, the research is suggesting the shoulder likes a little bit more. And this is probably in a stable position as well. We need to think about what our population is presenting with. And then this one, I throw this paper in because they use 20 reps. Um, so a lower intensity program again. But what they actually added was an instability challenge as well. They did a BOSU progressive balance push up. What they found was that the, there, was, there was improvement in the strength of the musculature around the joint. So rotator cuff, isolator strength improved. Scapulo, as the other scapular musculature strength improved, but there was no change in proprioception. So there was, there was strength of isolated muscles, but it didn't actually integrate it into the chain. And their conclusion in that paper was intensity is probably more important than instability. And I think there's probably a progression in there for us to, to, to think about. So before we get into the practical, um, 
as my summary from this is that we have an opportunity to potentially look at scaling mobility stability strength more equally. We need to think about if we're going to upgrade shoulder performance from a strength perspective, force, velocity um, attributes, we need to do something which is going to give the stability system a better ability to handle higher forces. Potentially then, therefore, using closed kinetic chain movements, thinking about kinetic chain integration and scaling intensity. Calisthenics is interesting because there's always somewhere to go. When you can do a, a wall walk, which will take you into some handstand movements in a bit, or a frog stand real basic, there's a progression. When you can do a freestanding handstand, there's a progression. We can constantly challenge the shoulder to produce stability and force at the same time. And when, in my mind, what I think is when we go back to the joint structure and we think about the architecture of the shoulder, creating high levels of stability and high levels of strength at the same time is crucial for a high performance shoulder. And I didn't have those. I was good at strength. I was doing quite a bit of strength work. But even in my rehab processes, all the stages, over and over again, was all low-level strength work, and my shoulder didn't stay in the socket. Kinetic chain integration. We had to get a calisthenics move nailed down. You have to start to think about learning this, the, the, the chain, or integrate the chain. There's no other way of doing it. The nice thing about it is you can't progress until you've done it. So you can do a handstand with a banana back. But we all look at it and go, it's pretty average. So moving through to get really beautiful movement forces you to start to think about training, training the system, integrating force, skill acquisition, developing awareness of where you are in space, all these really positive things. From an application perspective, these are my last three points. Calisense is fun. I hope you guys enjoy the session we're going to do with you today. Getting athletes balanced on their hands, challenging them in different positions, setting them movement challenges, they love it. So while they're having a good time learning to move in a new way, whether that's swinging from monkey bars and we're challenging some of the positions which Jacko is going to talk to us about in a bit, we're letting them have a great time, maybe during our prep work. But from a physio and SNC perspective, we're stood there just going, this is great. You're having a good time. You're enjoying what you're doing. And we're getting all of these benefits that we've talked about before. The shoulder's getting scaled. And I know that balancing on my hands and doing progressive calisthenics is more interesting and I'm more likely to adhere to it than doing this, which I had done a lot of. I also think we need to think about managing chaos in sport. Calisthenics opens up a world of different opportunities where we can start to move the shoulder into different positions. If we take a tight right to pull up, for example, coming through, sitting on top of the bar, transitioning across, creating stability and strength while we're moving through different positions. In many sports, whether it's white walks to slalom canoe or rugby, take rugby, for example, for our background, I never know where that hit's going to come from. I could have a 100 kilo guy running at me from back here, but a lot of our strength work happens here and our stability work happens here. I'm not prepared to hand a guy off here. I remember watching the Six Nations a few years ago, one of the Welsh players, dislocated or separated AC joint from trying to hand off. What calisthenics does is it allows us to start to give ourselves movement options. We're creating and giving the shoulder the opportunity to get strong in ranges which are outside of what our normal kind of lifting patterns might expose us to. And I think there's something really nice in that. I started using calisthenics with athletes, and I used to put it as the section at the top of my program that said athletic development. And people are like, what's that about? I was like, I don't know, I just want guys to move in new ways. I want to teach them to something different, because sports, and especially working in swimming, is very, it's the same, over and over again. I was like, I'm just going to teach you to move in a different way. So if you ever need that movement, you've got options. Jacko's learning to backflip at the moment. He did a dodgy one into the phone pit of the week, landed with his shoulder out here, and it's fine, because we train in these kind of positions. I'm not saying it's a gold standard solution. It's not saying it's the, the entire solution. What I'm, we're suggesting is that hopefully that's going to add something to your programs, um, and you, you find some value potentially of playing around with it. So I reckon that's enough chat from me. We're going to give you, give a, get into some practical. Um, just be aware, guys, um, we are going to show you some progressive positions. Just do it safe. If you have got shoulder instability issues, just progressively like, manage your own selves. You guys are all big people and know what you're doing, so um, just look after yourselves. You don't want to be the person who dislocates a shoulder on a, on a UKSA event. It's not cool. <laughs> so. All right, we'll, ask, we'll take questions at the end. Okay, so we are, we're going to do some stuff on the floor. We're going to do some stuff using the bars. As you can see, there's quite a lot of you. There's only three rigs, so don't be a hogger when we get onto there. Um, but we're going to start with some, some floor-based work where um, if you've never done any balancing on your hands before, it's going to be your first time. Don't be too scared. The first time I did it, I just face-planted. That was four and a half years ago, so you'll still probably be better than I was when I started. Um, but we'll need to just make sure we move like any, whether you've got iPads and bags, and just put bags and stuff to the side, get a bit of space, um, and then we will start ourselves on the floor. And just get a bit of space for yourself. Um, and then just, yeah, for, just from a safety point of view, do as much or little as you want. So you don't have to do every, anything at all. If you want to do more, 
and show us something. Happy to see anything. Um, and just your, you just need to take responsibility for your own, um, like Tim said, for your own sort of safety. So, as you were, but like mill in that those. This is this is simple. This is simple. So everyone can do this. Um, I could teach your mum to do it. Okay. Um, so we're going to start by fixing the hand on the floor. So talking about that kinetic chain that Tim was talking about. So this is our frog stand. Anyone that's, some of you may have done some of this stuff. If anyone's seen our stuff or you, maybe you've been to yoga and they talk about crow stands and things, you might have some experience. But we're going to, we're not going to spend half an hour taking you through like a, the best warm-up in the world for it. I want to start with some basics and build up so we can get into some of the more um, interesting stuff. So hands are going to go on the floor, shoulder width apart, and one of the first things we're going to try and do is we want to, as Tim's just talked a lot about the, how the rotator cuff and that external rotation is key to sort of setting that scapula in a nice stable position. So just as if when we're squatting, we think about trying to rip and grip the floor, we're going to do the same thing with our hands in that position. So I don't turn my hand out to the outside, but what I'm trying to do is screw the shoulder so we're starting to get some of that external rotation when elbow starts to point backwards. When the elbow points backwards, that then also gives you a nice little ledge to rest Firstly, the inside of your knee, and I'll go a little bit side on. So I'm going to put the, my, knee, uh, my elbow in that crease of my knee. I'm going to lean forward. I'm going to grip with my fingertips a lot because your fingertips are going to stop your face planting like I did the first time. No one told me that when I started. And then I'm going to lean forward, and I'm just going to hang out there and see what that feels like. Not resting, but actually actively pushing the ground down. If I feel confident, I'm going to try and take one leg off. And then if I feel like I've got my balance point, I can try and dab that toe until maybe you can actually get yourself hovering for the first time. So just have a play around with that first. <laughs> really important that we are, you're not resting in that position, you're trying to apply force down effectively into the floor. Start to get used to using like your fingertips to control yourself and feel that position. That's okay, I'll go for this one. Um, and then for maybe some of, some of us, sometimes we get put off by the worry of falling down onto the floor with our head. Um, but that balance point is ever so slightly further forward than, than you think. It's about trying to create a position where my center of mass is uh, distributed around my base of support. So that means where, my, where I can get my hip position related to the rest of my, where my hands are supporting me on the floor. Um, in terms of scaling things very easily, like when we're doing weights, dead simple, once your athlete can do 100 kilo on a, on a deadlift, you can add like the smallest, whatever plates you've got to put on the bar, we can just incrementally increase it. With body weight, we don't have that, uh, that sort of leisure to be able to do that easily, but there is easy ways we can scale things. So in terms of where I place my body, I can start to distribute my weight differently to make the, um, the, the force or the load that I am feeling or having to generate gradually more and more and more difficult. So I, um, so I started with uh, my elbow in that crease, quite low to the ground, hip quite far behind where my, um, where my hands are. That distribution of weight makes the balance easier, and it also makes the load on the shoulder easier. But what I'm going to try and do now is I'm going to go up and try and put my knees on top of my triceps. Um, so all of a sudden, the hip is now a lot higher. Exactly the same thing. I'm screwing with the shoulders still, and I'm trying to get a position where now my shoulders are loaded much more at the front. My hip is much higher. I'm a little bit further away from the floor. feels a little bit more scary. But you should feel like your shoulders having to work harder in that position just because of where you've distributed your body weight. Cool, and then let's, let's just... You can just play where we are, give us a look at, we'll look at two more things. Ultimately, um, we're going to try and take this position, and we can, we can take it wherever we want. We can take it out long ways, we can take it out vertically, um, which would then be obviously into your handstand. But again, progressively loading, I go from that position where I feel comfortable, what's it like if I challenge my ability to move around there and control that balance? Like balancing is a case of constantly losing your um, balance, but having options to bring it back. Can I, can I like, feel like I'm losing it forward and grip with my fingertips to pull myself back? So have a little play around at moving. Side to side, side is easier, forwards and backwards harder, so be prepared for that. Then we'll look at one load. And then, you, and then, yeah, it's good. That, 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 <laughs> I 
Nice guys, good. Okay, cool. So, if you want to progressively load, when my, if you've got skinny legs like me, I used to have a bit bigger legs when I played rugby, but I was a winger, so I was still relatively skinny. Um, then the, the legs, legs they, even if they're skinny like mine, they're still going to weigh a fair amount. When they're resting on my elbows, the, force, the, the weight of that, some of it is being transferred into my elbow, which is nicely stacked onto my wrist vertically, should just be able to rest there onto the floor. I'm actively pushing down. But if I can get to a position where um, I take that knee off, and I can play around with the position of that leg, but take that knee off or take two knees off and be able to control, in one, control in that position, but two, be stable through my scap. So if I lose, remember the slide about the stability of the scapula? If I lose the stability of my scapular position with scapula, then I'm going to lose potentially 24% of my strength. I need that strength, so nice position of the scapula. You're pushing the ground down, you're not resting. We need to be active through there, and then so that the shoulders can start to fire. Have a, have a feel of what that's like. And then Tim's going to then show off, and then we'll move on. Cool. So I think some of you certainly look potentially as hot as I feel. So we've hardly done anything, but we're already starting to get a little bit. There's a lot of people in the small room. But we can start to see how, like, straight away, but already, like, skate. And this can be part of, like, it could be the end of a warm-up for um, I'm working with a swimmer at the moment where she's been doing a little bit of this just to, just to finish her warm-up off. Like Tim said, gone beyond sort of some TheraBand or some cable activation or whatever, and I want to actually just tear up to be able to do some some more intense stuff, and that idea about scaling intense, the intensity of the stability demand. Um, if we're going into like, if, we, if you might be doing some prone, like Y positions or T's, but particularly this Y position, trying to get sort of mid-lower trap going, and we might you know, start with hands with someone, and we go to 1.25 kilo with somebody, and like, where do we go after that? They can do 1.25 easy, like do we just keep adding on weight, or is there something more demanding that's got the same sort of position. And the, the other point that we're going to try and get through in the pulling as well is the difference between me moving my arm around the shoulder, how about when this, cl uh, this closed kinetic chain principle where we got the hand fixed, and I'm going to do the same position and movement, but I'm actually now going to fix the hand, fix the shoulder, and rotate the body around that. So if Tim goes into his straight arm position with his crow, and then he's now going into a position where he's rotating around, but effectively going into more and more and more to then his full shoulder flexion. If he's happy, then the control of the legs, and that's, that's then we can start to look at like a more, that's obviously a handstand, but like how are we working in terms of getting the uh, integration through the rest of the body if we're doing something like swimming where they talk an awful lot about their streamlined position and how important they've got one, uh, spatial awareness and kinesthetic awareness of where they are in space and two, being able to integrate that with the rest of the body and be able to control um, that position. We'll have the opportunity um, after we've gone to do it to, for you to play around with a bit more of that um, in a minute. Looking at a straight arm position, the other option is we're all starting in that crow bent, which is a bit easier, we're oh, shortening yeah. that lever length, but if Tim starts in a bent position, He's then also got the opportunity to press out of that, and we're starting to develop some like vertical pushing strength. And we sort of um, quite keen advocates, just because we've seen it ourselves, of if I'm the benefit for a certain type of athlete of doing, being able to do some vertical pressing when you're having to control the movement of the rest of your body over a military press, where if I'm struggling, I'm going to start to arch that back and try and make it more horizontal. You, you, with, with something like this, you're getting stability, you're getting control, you're learning something new, you're getting that full integration, and if you get it wrong, you fail, rather than get it wrong and just squeeze that rep out and go, great, put me down for an 85 boss because I got it up. Um, so it forces us to be more specific with our, or clinical with our training. Right, so we're going to go, um, we're going to give you three things. One of them is being able to have a bit more play around, a bit more time on that, if you like. We're going to look at some hanging base movements and then also scaling some of the floor-based work using um, 
the wall. So we will be using that wall in a bit and that wall um, when we get into there. Um, so thinking about the other... Oh, that's my, when the mic goes right up to me. Uh, my, so um, hanging base movement. So again, closing the chamber, we're now going on the, on the bar. And a lot of us will know that about in terms of this position where I'm trying to get my scapula stable, so my active hang, that's my starting point. And that's pretty, pretty easy, pretty basic for people. We understand that principle. Um, making sure that at the same time, I'm integrating that into the rest of my body. So core's on, glutes on, so I've got that straight line position. Guys, we see this all the time with athletes with like 20 kilos around the waist doing pull-ups and we don't get this active hang right, we pop the rib cage straight away. And what we're doing effectively is just shortening the lat. We're fine, we're, we're cranking on the lat, but we're forgetting about what this, the importance of this position is. We wouldn't allow that if we were doing lower body movements, but we often see it in the gym with upper body pulling. So just think about it. And what you'll find is athletes' numbers will go from 10 pull-ups to maybe three or four because the difference has started to move with that connection is massive. Um, have a play around with me and get on the rigs. Um, so, first option we're going to look at is once I've created this active, nice, stable position, is what movement options have I got from there? So, just as um, we were talking about moving the body around the shoulder, I can do the same thing in my hanging position where I come through. Shoulder's got 360 degrees range. And, and coming back. Yeah. So, that is, people call that skin, skin the cap with no idea, or semi, no idea why. Um, so, then into. What happens if I take that active position? I want to challenge the load. Like we took one leg off in the frog stand, what happens if I take one hand off? I must stay active in this position, because if I don't, what happens is I lose control, I'm going to then unwind. Yeah. Think about what's happening in this traction position, guys, as well. We just let go of the bar with the one hand. The shoulder then goes into a dead position, potentially, and it unwinds. And then what we're doing is telling the shoulder we need to integrate it into the hip. So by retracting, depressing the shoulder, we're sucking the joint into the, or the head of the socket into the, sorry, head of the humerus into the um, scalp. We're starting to create some stability and we're linking that through the chain. We're going to do some human flag stuff towards the end of the session, but that is effectively the upper arm of our human flag. It's just a super high intensity single arm hang, effectively. So, have a feel of that. Can you take one arm off, stay there strong? What happens if you let it unwind? Can you then externally rotate and are you strong enough to be able to pull through there and grab the bar again? Have you got, what's your, what's your, are you tight in the shoulder? Can you actually rotate or is it too tight? Or can you come through round and rotate even further to be able to face then the other way? If we had like a full, um, like rigs that you've got in a lot of the facilities, then we can start to climb and change and reach for, and actually start to go, give your athlete no constraint, right, you've got to get from, you've got to get from here to there. No, you're not going to get no chance. But no, if we had a series of, in a rig, you've got to get from this position to that position, Oh, how many reps do I do, boss? Well, just got to get to there. You've got to do some problem solving. You've got to get into some positions that you're not used to. Um, and the last point for me before you guys have a go is think about what grip does for the shoulder. We know maximal gripping is going to fire shoulder stabilizers. So even when we've got our guys hanging, if they're hanging under fatigue or they're getting tired, we're getting shoulder stability just as a result of hanging because we're forcing grip on their body weight and we can progressively load that as well. So have a play around. Oh, Jackie, you know, wall walks? Yeah, do the walks. Okay. So we're going to give you like a wall walk, just so you can play around with, and you can just mix in around between the, uh, the, the different exercises. Yes, so one thing that people, um, I think Tim had one of the Eric Cressy slides up, anyone that follows this, if he's really keen on, and you'll have probably done a lot of, um, with your athletes, you might have done some of your bear crawls, and particularly that reverse bear crawl being good, because it talks a lot about serratus activation when we're going through uh, more than 90 degrees of shoulder flexion. The, the, the sort of question becomes, when this gets, starts to get quite easy, how do we then scale that intensity, or do we go, well, because my athlete can do 20 reverse bear crawls, like they're all, they're golden to go. Well, if we lift the legs, if we lift the feet up, increase the load on the shoulder, and then going from that horizontal position into the vertical position, we're starting to then get all of that good work through it that you're going to get from your bear crawl, but we're starting to just um, challenge it more, and we also get a lot more integration into the full kinetic chain. Um, and then the nice thing with this is, not everyone's going to want to go straight the way up there. You can just go up as far as you want and come down as far as you want. The, the strength demand of that is also high. So we're getting strength. We're getting stability. We're getting integration into the rest of your, uh, rest of your body. Yeah? Um, shoulder taps here. And then anyone that's, if you want to, again, like we did with the bar, like we did with the hand, we can then increase. I'll get out of your way. So, again, increase the load demand by one hand. Not for everyone that today, also not for all of the athletes. Like, pick and choose what you think is appropriate, A, for you today, and B, for some of the athletes. Um, we get the opportunity on that wall walk down, guys, as well, to rep. So one, fine. Stick five together. 
and then see how your shoulders and your core are feeling. Think about controlling the hips as you walk through, making a nice controlled position. You're going to find that we're still, we're getting, think about why it is, we go back to it, we're going from press up position and we're going up. But we're starting to access range of movement, we're getting strong and range of movement and we're integrating that into a midsection and we have the opportunity to cue midsection. Have a play? Yeah, so have a play. Grab a rig, grab, the, grab a wall. Wrong. Okay, guys, this not for me. Yeah. Let's bring it back in quickly. Just a, a great question around um, the active and dead hang position. We don't want to just feel we've got to keep athletes in active hang all the time. As Jacko says, that unwind is useful. But when we're working muscle ups or even our pull ups, we'll have people come from a active hang position. But we'll every between every single rep, we'll encourage them to drop out into a dead hang and then recreate that movement by setting. And then we're going to pull through into our pull up position. The reason being that we can start to encourage full range of movement. So if we're going to go handstands even, but particularly if we want to move people through to muscle ups, we want them to be able to hit that bottom position. And we need to be in what is effectively a dead hang to create the length. And then we can snap the joint in, bad word. We can create <laughs> tension in the joint and then start to create the power. So we'll, we'll show you the, the muscle up in a few minutes. But feel like, don't feel like you've got to stay inactive the whole time and don't let you guys just work through their comfortable range. Encourage them to get in and out. I know we've worked with athletes before where we, they do pull-ups and they stay in where there's comfortable range. If you drop them into a dead hang, they literally can't do another rep. They might have got more if they stay in their comfortable range, but you put them into dead hang and they can't get back out. Again, we talk about backing down a lot. Backing down, backing down, backing down. This is backing down, but under traction and you're managing your whole body weight to do that and then integrating it into pulling movement, which is a lot closer than us doing backing down on, a, on the floor with a YTW. Those exercises have value, but we're, what we're talking about is what happens when you want to scale that past that level. Potentially get starting to get the guys to think about these shapes. So, I've seen Joel do a good, uh, he's going into like a skin the cam. Anyone, if anyone's got any chalk, with some people are losing, someone's losing, the, losing the grip. Um, but so, looking at then how do we, like trying to scale that like integration of making, um, that sort of full body control um, and strength in some of these positions, what does that look like? And this isn't to say everyone then needs, we need to, we think all of our athletes need to learn all of these things. No, not at all, but it's just where can some of it go? So um, my skin in the cat, I can come through and I can lock in midsection, lock in shoulders, keep in a stable position and come back through. That progression there, guys, you'll see Jacko winds himself in and then he actually ends up with his shoulder internally rotated. Safe place for us to start learning to back lead because we're packing the shoulder in, pecs and lats having a nice time in here, just creating shoulder stability. The progression of that is then actually to do it palm down position. And then can we get into external rotation, stabilize the shoulder and then back lever, but those progressions through. We don't teach that to start off with because think about the, the stress you're gonna place on bicep in that shape if we're tight through the shoulders. But again, we, one of our key phrases when we're teaching calisthenics is earn the right to progress. We want people to actually show they've got competency before we let them move through because we're dealing with high forces. And the other thing at this point just to throw in is we've been through this problem ourselves and we didn't have a training background to support it. So the, the load that you're going to put through connective tissues, tendons and ligaments is going to take time for those to recover. So our suggestion is just integrate it slowly. If we start loading through into some like doing calisthenics every day of the week, we're going to end up with elbow issues, golfer's elbow um, some pr pretty nasty shoulder stuff. So it does, you need to let them have time to recover and then progress through. Yeah, in the same way we would progressively load any of your weight training stuff, we need to progressively load, load this, but just we're not using weight. Um, I had a good little, little chat with um, Scott there where 
Um, it was just a simple movement, just that um, active hang. But when we, and then we get this a lot with people when we're doing some stuff for the first time, when we're used to focusing only on like one or two joints when we're trying to actually create a shape or movement or be strong. Doing something where you, we want to control our scap position, I want to control my torso, I want to control my pelvis, I'm trying to get you to do like three, four, five things at the same time. It's a challenge for the brain to try and link and connect those things together. So like that back lever there, I'm doing all sorts of stuff in terms of where my shoulder position is, packing it in, making sure my scaps are tight, making sure I've got that um, position through, through the trunk and connecting my, my rib cage to my pelvis and then having the rest of the sort of posterior chain firing through the, the lower body to keep myself out there. Um, it's, it's not to say that then, oh craggy, I've got to, no one has to necessarily learn about that, but the principle of challenging my demand of linking strength throughout the whole of my body, what, um, what application and transfer into whatever sport I'm going to do, do I get off the back of it? That's, that's the sort of idea. Yeah. Um, and I think into, um, into other movements as well, like obviously the sport specific outcome, but if we get good at overhead positions, what does that do for our snatch performance or our, our clean and jerks? Because we've just given the guys more confidence. If we're going to pull a bar through and all of a sudden I've got to stabilize it and stop the bar in a top hand position, um, if we're giving them more control here, more end range strength, and we know the guys struggle here. We, I've done a lot of work in swimming, and they're, they're piss weak up here, and they should be strong. It should be a strong shape, but it's end range strength. So creating conditions and environment where they can play with end range strength, build the capacity within it, because again, we talked about you have to be strong if you're going to hold a nice handstand in that shape. We're getting them as a result of just training without having to worry about, well, how do I do something specific for this? We're just playing, having fun with movement, and we're getting better control and mobility around the shoulder. Um, so we're going to do a muscle-up. If, if we think about, um, let's think about a fly swimmer, what they have to do in their, their catch overhead, and they don't want to be short in that position, they want to be long for their, 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 um, their, their reach and their actual uh, stroke length. They want to be out there, so they want that full range. They don't want to go into that position and lose streamline, so we've got to make that connection through the rest of the body. When they're in the pool, they're supported by the water, so it's a bit easier. But from there, they're catching, they're pulling, and then they're pushing, so they're coming through, they're internal rotating, they're driving out. Like, the it, number one like, thing for um, a fly swimmer would be something like a, a bar muscle-up where he's going through all of that, but getting nice and strong. Let me make sure I didn't slide on the floor. Whilst we're in there. Um, God, sorry. All the time, he's having to control his whole body, he's having to control that alignment, he's having to then change where his body's going in space and he needs to have control massively of keeping the ball in the socket. So when he comes over the top there, that, that's making sure that he's not losing the head out humerus translating forward because he's going to get himself in some, in some trouble. So that's not like a basic thing that's going up, but it's where can we start to scale some of these things but that's and that's an element of speed to it as well. Yeah, so. that's a power-based movement, force and velocity starting. So we have to pull from that dead hang position, pull hard and fast, rather than just chipping the, the chin above the bar. We're actually working to try and get the bar down to sternum or even higher. The higher we get the bar, the higher we pull, the more force we can put down at speed. The easier our transition is, the less we need to do around that or worry about that shoulder. So if we come in and we're just like nipping above the bar, all of a sudden people are going to fight it and we get one goes and then the other one goes. That's just a horrible position to be in. So again, working those guys through, we work our guys through with, with bands and starting to get them to, to train the speed component because we don't train speed in upper body pulling a lot. But the muscle-up gives us a reason to do it. It gives us an outcome of going, I want a muscle-up, cool. Let's train pulling velocity. Get high above the bar. You stand on the front. Um, final little one from me. You've got Pete McKnight to play, uh, blame for this one. He was like, you have to do a flag. So <laughs> what happens if we put the, the pulling of that one arm and then the pushing of the one arm and join those two things together and try and then integrate that into the rest of the um, kinetic chain? Then we get something like a flag. So... Top arms pulling, bottom arms pushing. That's just a challenge, just neural in because you're just not used to doing those two things. And then we've got that whole lateral chain on the top side having to connect together. Same as that active hang. If you can't go active and you want to skin the cat, if you're not active through your, your shoulder, you've got nothing to pull yourself to. If I'm not active on that top arm, my hip has got to stay connected with the shoulder, integrated in. That's what keeps the legs out. You're not actually lifting necessarily your legs up. Your legs just stay connected to your, to your hips. Um, Rest that through. Yeah, so um, some of the, what we, wanted, what we wanted to do is take something um, like the flag and go, how do we like progressively scale this up and down? Because it probably looks like quite a complex one and probably one that you go, 
Um, it's, a little, it's a little bit out there, but we thought we'd, we'd try and use um, some of what we, we'd uh, term um, the locker, which are just little skills, uh, skills little, little tools we can use. Um, lots of things that you'll know, like using eccentrics, adding an increase in uh, or decrease in stability, isometric positions at different angles, um, and then also body positions in terms of your lever length, so you can just change that um, load demand. So the bottom arm in the human flag is really getting good at driving from a position where um, my shoulder has got to be pushed down and away. I've got to then turn out, so I'm getting some like horizontal abduction. The biggest thing that people struggle with on their flag is that they just actually don't have the ability, one, from a, the shoulders are too tight to get into a nice position, and two, they haven't got the posterior delt strength and control of that uh, shoulder, the humeral head and the scapula, to be able to hold themselves in that position whilst they're trying to drive away. So rather than just being in like a, a sort of T position, finding, okay, that's quite easy. I mean, even now I'm still getting a little bit of shaking going on in there. I can start to scale that then up where... Before we add that one in. You want to see Tim do a handstand on that? <laughs> No, thanks, Dave. <laughs> um, would be getting into that then position and coming in through here, and can I actually push myself out? So I'm not worried about the other part of the movement, what the mother leg, my leg and trunk is doing, but just starting to get strong and getting good in that position. As Tim talked, talked about um, handing somebody off, I played professional rugby for 13 years. Um, I had a very good s &C coach, a French guy, um, so he was crazy. We did some weird stuff with him that was cool. Um, but in terms of pressing and pushing, it was only ever here, and it was only ever here. And all those positions where you've got to hand somebody off or tackle someone, you know, I was never particularly good at tackling. So like <laughs> sticking your arm out there, it's just a turnstile. Whereas like now, I, still, I wouldn't want to go back and play rugby <laughs> just because life moves on. But I would feel so, my shoulders would feel so much better um, now than they were back then. I remember my first game back after breaking my coracoid, acromion, and desiccated AC joint, having this massive thing strapped to it, and just every time someone came to tackle me there, I was just like trying to come in with the other side. I just didn't have any confidence in the shoulder, and I would have never even dared try and attempt something um, like that. So then some of the other um, little things we try and use to um, I'll get this way. We know, guys, that um, the human flag for summer athletes is, is a fairly big reach, but I hope we're just starting to just think about where it could potentially go through a longer-term process. A progression through the movement like this, is, we call it a stability ball flag, it gives Jacko the opportunity to get into a position, build some confidence out here. We think about where athletes don't like to go when we see out with our shoulder flexion position. They like it up in here. Taking up overhead is where they're not going to be keen on. But this gives us a bit of support. We're building that proprioception. But like with the isometrics in the hand balancing progressions, the job here is to be pushing maximally all the time. You could do a frog stand and hang out there for two minutes and go, great, I've got a two-minute uh, frog stand. But it's pointless in terms of we're not creating progressive overload for the shoulder. So all the time, we're looking for 10-second rep maxes. Like if you take some of the, the prilipin conversions of RMs into isometric holds, we're looking at probably 8, 9, 10, 12 seconds, something around that for an equivalent of 70 to 80 percent rep max. So using progressions within those, even a five second if you want to go higher, but we have that, um, that conversion there, it goes back to the research around intensity of find a way which is going to create intensity around the shoulder rather than just getting comfortable in a position. And obviously within this, we're getting that proprioception of starting to understand where is my shoulder in space and where is my stable position whilst linking the chain in together. Yeah. Um, and then I'll show you one more, then you can have a go at some of these. Where, um, so that was like adding some like uh, taking some load off, adding some stability, but then it's also quite challenging there. Um, another one we've, you can see on the board is like changing your body angle. Um, so me trying to be fully out horizontals, tough, I'm fighting all the gravity all at once. Can I um, create the same shape, but just be at say 45 degrees or, or less by changing where my hand position is on the bar so that actually when I'm out in this position, I can link and do the whole thing, but I'm not... It's not the end product, but I'm starting to get all those three things in together. I'm getting all the good stuff from that top arm pulling, that bottom arm pushing, and integrating into the rest of, rest of the chain. And throw that into your play sessions. We're talking about having rigs and doing some different hanging and transition positions. Get the guys to transition through and tell them they've got to do an angle flag. Have a go at it on the rig. It's not that hard. Yeah. You'll feel that position to actually get into it. You get the connection, and then you might actually leave today going, do you know what? I might actually be able to do a human flag because it's 
It's not, so Jacko tells me, because I say it's not that difficult. If you can push and you can pull, it's not that hard. Um, you just need to learn to progress it through. And then just have a feel of what is it like to get in and out of this position and can I actually do something to maybe dangle the floor. Can I create enough tension through this push and pull to actually suspend my yeah. legs off the floor? You're having to produce an awful lot of pushing and pulling force in that position applied well. Um, and any, any of our sort of overhead athletes or um, like canoe slalom, we're getting into some of these positions and we're having to push and pull and be strong and stable in there. Like there is, it's more than just a good holiday photo. There is some, there is some things and elements of it that we can apply really well into sports performance. We've been doing it with, 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 with some of the power athletes that we're working with when it's applicable and we, when we, we're seeing lots of good um, performances off the back of it. Guys, we have five minutes. If you want to come and um, just ask us about anything practical whilst you're doing it, we've got a bit of time and then we're going we're gonna to wrap it up. Just if you're going to try that flag, top hand over, bottom hand, palm down, open up. Don't end up yourself into kind of some of these positions, but yeah. palms down into that shape. Five minutes, guys. If you want to have a play with anything we've done before or try some of those frog, back cam frog stand progressions, back levers, go for your lives, see how it feels. Some great questions and, and discussion um, around some of these movements. And I, again, I think we just encourage you to, to start to think about how it applies to the sports, the athletes that you're working with, the sports that, you, that you're involved in, um, and just underpin some of that practical with some of the concepts that we're talking around about the potential benefits. And we'll touch on those as I just finish off to, to wrap up. But um, we've had some, some great questions. Is there anybody who wants to sort of throw a question out? And um, we'd be happy to take any questions. That's exactly how we train muscle ups. Yeah. yeah. So do the same. Do the same thing of, of, of putting those those sets together. So we'll go typical rep, rep ranges. We might be working one to fives on that heavy um, heavy pull ups loaded. Again, trying to maintain good technique and particularly around making sure that they're pulling from a dead position. We want them to, to get strength through that range, and then putting the rest periods in and then and then going with the bands. We we talk a lot about that about that that. Um, post, -act potentiation, post activation potentiation with that banded work. If you want to move fast, you've got to train fast. And, and sticking a band on somebody just to teach them the velocity because they can't do it without it. it and that's the real key to the muscle. We get people who are easily strong enough to do it, but they, they, one, they don't pull high enough, and partly that's because they can't create speed from end range. That rate of force development is a limiting factor. Um, so, yeah, definitely we, we use that. And one. Oh. There's some stuff that we really like around the hand balancing for swimming, particularly we thought a lot about it, and the transfer of training effects in swimming. I've always questioned for a long time, we can get guys doing 100 kilo bench press in swimming, but actually, if, is my time spent better teaching them more proprioception? So I get them hand balancing and they become more aware of where their hand is in space. When we're looking for sensitivity in that catch position, if, the, if they hit the lane rope or they don't know where they are or whatever it is, if they know, like we take football and uh, take a, a field-based sport, invasion sport, we would do a lot of work on agility of creating stability through the hip and the ankle. When we've got f sports where we've got some level of upper body requirement like swimming or even rugby, I think there's a real value in being able to start to think about hip, knee, ankle, and train it the same way of starting to create movement options around that. So they're just better connected. 
And then with swimming as well, the massive importance of, like you say, with like the, the, the speed-based work and the heavy work, is getting them to think about that connection and maintaining good core activation, integration, kinetic chain integration through the chain, because when they catch, the last thing we want them to do is go into a position here. And we see we let them do that in the gym all the time because they just want to ramp numbers up on the pull-ups. So we've had to take our guys a long way back, and they don't like it because they're all of a sudden do two pull-ups when they were doing 10 before, but it, and rebuilding it, and then progressively into the muscle-ups, and then they go, okay, and I kind of get where it's going now. Yeah, yeah and swimming's one of those things where that catch position, I think there was, I'd done, for my, when I did my UKCA, my case study was on one of the power swims we got, and it was um, the force, uh, uh, an AB, able-bodied, like 50 meter freestyle sprinter is something like five newtons of force. That's 16 it. 16 kilos. So like yeah. making them stronger and stronger and stronger, how does that improve my swimmer when actually they can't, because the water moves as they're pushing it, are they better off having a better position, better feel, whatever that means, to, but that's what they're using to it, um, a better a stable scap to be able to apply whatever small amounts of forces they can do, link it into the whole body and then be able to repeatedly do that constantly even when they're tired. Um, Everyone's just being stronger. Everyone wants to be stronger. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would be like your basic strength to get like a strict bar muscle up? Strict bar muscle up. Um, yeah, great question. So we start off with making sure that we've got a decent pull-up technique. So with that might go back to basics of having to make sure that we are losing the midsection. We had a quick conversation with someone before. We see CrossFit um, and their bar muscle up is a Hollow, or tight, hollow body, a tight arch, hollow body. So they're allowing that, that um, back arch to arch because they're then going to whip it forwards and fire the hip towards the bar. And, and their muscle-up technique is when you can see the bar, then you're going to transition through. What we want to make sure that we're doing is giving the guys a kinetic chain integration to be able to actually hold that bottom position and then pull and maximize short force development from the upper body as opposed to using momentum to drive the hip towards the bar. So making sure that their pull-up technique is tidy, and then we start thinking about how high can you pull um, body weight, and then we're like Gil was saying, we can then start to use some balance to train that speed. And we don't really worry too much about the transition. And a straight bar dip, most people can do a straight bar dip, but you can throw that in as, an as, a, uh, as a separate exercise of just being able to, to get into a low body position so we can transfer in the catch. But where we see people go wrong is they don't pull high enough, so they're, they're kind of here on the bar, and then they want to throw one arm and then support it, and then they throw the other one. And the interesting thing with that is typically, it would be, say if I'm right-handed, it would be my, my strong arm, which is going to be the one which fires first. Because it, neuro, neuromuscularly and from a training perspective, my brain knows fast into a rotation because I've been throwing a ball since I was three years old or whatever. It's the non-dominant side which then has some time to catch up. So using a band, rather than letting the guys do an ugly muscle where they're finding themselves in a horrible position, using the band and encouraging them to earn the right to progress so that we can actually train controlled speed. And then we go back to that whole thing from our perspective, we're looking at limiting unwanted glenohumeral translation in the fossa, pulling through and having a nice tidy movement. Whilst we're developing vertical pulling strength without um, worrying about the transition or speed about the transition and then when they've got those two things we can stick them together into the movement. I think I look at the, the, the muscle up as a lot like teaching Olympic weightlifting. We will break those movements down to start to create the speed velocity uh, force and um, velocity characteristics that we want and then we start to piece those things together. Does that answer the question? Yeah. There's a difficult bit in, in calisthenics is it is the most brutal form of training to learn. Like, to learn to handstand is one of the worst things you're going to do because it takes so long and you fail so much. But the reward at the end of it is massive. Um, I think from a group perspective, we, it's giving them the stuff which is going to fit in with how you can manage that group dynamic. So hand balancing is something that most of the guys can get on with. I, I do some work with some youth swimmers. I mean, if I show them hand balance, my, my wife runs a, a swimming business, and we have them on a three-day camp. You know, I can't show them hand balance on, on the first day because that's all they want to do. So, if we, I think, but, but they love it, and they can actually, it's, it's fairly safe and progressive, and I think youth athletes, it's generally that age is sort of maybe like 12 to 16, are quite good at managing their own abilities and then um, progressing through within that. So I think, the, I think it is about starting to go, there's so much stuff which you can give people and go, this isn't quite right for you just yet because you can't do body weight pull-ups, so there's no point you trying a, a muscle-up at this stage, but you can really crack on with your handstands and then... 
We also talk a lot about strength and play, uh, and there's lots of just basic stuff. I mean, even if you go into the basis of tight right or push-ups, starting to move into different positions. Some, there's some various different hand balancing exercises, elbow levers, which are really easy. It looks like really sexy, but it's actually quite achievable for people. So it, my mind would be like, either get the group doing the same thing, or just make sure that we're giving each of them something a little bit sort of a sexy to work towards, um, as opposed to just kind of going, well, you can't muscle up. But um, the muscle ups are a really interesting one because we had a, a para swimmer who could do like 20 pull ups but couldn't muscle up. And we're like, your problem's not strength, like, your problem is he doesn't move quickly. Um, does that answer? Yeah. All right. Cool. We're around, guys, so come find us. Are there, do, are there any point I wanted to add on to, to that question was that that comes down to like, how do we interact and coach our athletes? Like, I've been in a rugby environment where I want to lift what that guy's lifting because of my ego. Like, we have to leave the ego at the door a little bit and how we as coaches encourage people that that's not right for you right now, but this is going to be right for you. That's just how, that's like the, the human interaction of, of coaching. Um, so just uh, some, some take-home messages, guys. I'm going to try and get this slide back up quickly. Um, we've got, uh, there's some interesting stats from um, the NFL, which I'm just going to try and leave you with around some, some take-home messages. Um, 52% of NFL of athletes attending the draft at the NFL have arrived with some form of shoulder history. So 52% of people, it's a, it's a significant number. <clears throat> the issue with that is that those players often get picked lower down the draft and they play less games and the athletes that aren't, don't have a shoulder injury in the first two seasons. So it's having a significant impact on, um, on their careers. Also, it's, it's an American statistic, but 30% of athletes play in university um, sport in America. Um, here we go. Sorry about that. Um, have some of overhead sports have some form of injury. Now we're not suggesting that calisthenics isn't is, is the golden bullet, but what we're suggesting is it's probably a part of training which maybe is not being included, and we think it can have some benefits. So have we got some opportunity to change um, these statistics? We know we get shoulder injuries on a regular basis. So our take-home messages are maybe think about giving the shoulder something a little bit different. It needs the architecture of it, and overloading, progressive overload is a really interesting concept around the stabilization. What tools do we have available to start to create that progressive overload so we can match strength improvements and ultimately take us closer to a high-functioning shoulder which is able to meet the sport-specific demands? Um, you can use hand balance and hanging progressions. There's a ton of those you can play around with. You have those already. You'll be doing some of that. So I would just think about what you're getting as a result of that. Um, integrated kinetic chain. Give the guys some time to play, and don't think that this is an and or. So how does this kind of fit into a periodized plan? Is it part of a warm up? Is it part of an off season program? We're going to learn to handstand because it's fun over the summer. It's something a little bit different. Yeah, um, and just one thing from me, just to finish. Like some of you will have tried some of these things out there, and you looked at Tim going, "I made it. It made it look easy. Like why can't I do this thing? It just doesn't feel like I've got any." any strength there at all. And we know we get what we train for, so it might be that you just have never trained in that position with that bottom arm flag, for example. You've never trained it. And then it's a case of then evaluating, do I, have I got athletes that it would be beneficial to have some strength and some movement options in that position, if you're taking that as an example. So feeling like you've not, it doesn't feel, it feels almost impossible is what we sort of say. That might be, it's because we've not actually been there and trained there to be strong. If it's then useful to be strong in some of those positions and stable in some of those positions, then we can start to think about what bits can I incorporate into some of my athletes' training. Yeah, remember where we came from. Pretty, like, worst place you could do to get into some of this stuff. References you'll get on the slides, guys, if you want to go and look those up. And just one last thing. If this has been interesting, we've only been able to go into a certain amount of stuff, but we're running a coaches seminar, um, which we actually launched in today. It goes live on the website today and on, on 13th of October. It's a one-day event um, in Nottingham where we can delve into a bit more detail around some of this stuff. Um, the early bird offer is on for the first month. Um, so if you want to come, you can check that out on the website. We're on, you'll find us on all of our social media channels. Um, so engage with us, come and find us over the weekend. We love interacting with people and if you've got questions and thoughts, we'd love um, to hear them. But thanks for your participation, guys. You've been awesome. Have a great weekend, and we hope to catch up with you, some of you, over the next few days. <laughs>